today, and now the hangover. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. In today's show, we look at the problem of liquidity in the markets created by loose central bank policy, liquidity which is looking for a home and which will haunt the financial markets for years. And as this unwinds, if it unwinds, this will have a significant impact on asset prices and markets ahead. But for now, Markets are banking on the idea that central banks will be willing to go all in again should the post-pandemic recovery go south. So since the global financial crisis, many central banks have been throwing liquidity into the financial system to prop it up in the light of elevated risks. The first rounds of temporary quantitative easing turned into a more permanent feature of the markets. When the COVID hit, and in response, for about 20 months, central banks have funneled an unprecedented amount of cash into the financial system, aiming to limit the worst effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on the economy. And now, with an eye on inflation, they're changing course with big ramifications for stocks and bonds. As I discussed recently, the US Federal Reserve said that it would begin to reduce asset purchases, a key part of its stimulus efforts, by 15 billion US dollars each month. The program is set to wrap up by the middle of 2022. And yet, the central bank's balance sheet is still growing. It's not alone. Australia's central bank also took steps to ease monetary policy this week. On Tuesday, the Reserve Bank formally dropped its yield curve control policy tool, which pinned the yield on the April 2024 government bond at 0.1%. It marked the conclusion of a dramatic episode in domestic debt markets, as the yield on the bond soared above 0.8% at the hands of aggressive bond markets. But Dr Lowe disputed that the central bank was in a battle with the market and said that the decision to drop the target was simply because the bank had made faster progress towards achieving its inflation objective. We didn't do it because of market pricing, but because it was the right thing to do and was consistent with our framework, Dr Lowe said. The past few days had, quote, been a turbulent one for the bond market. And Lowe added that the central bank's inaction led to uncertainty about its policy stance that hurt market pricing and liquidity. But I think there's a bit of post-rationalisation there. And the Bank of Canada said last week that it would stop expanding its balance sheet, and the Central European Bank is also slowing the pace of its purchases this quarter. And New Zealand, Iceland and a few other countries have also lifted interest rates already in an attempt to head off inflationary pressures, which many bankers continue to say are temporary, but which are running hot. Now, there was a chance the Bank of England would become the first major central bank to raise interest rates since the crisis hit on Thursday, but instead it held rates steady at a record low 0.1%. In fact, the Bank of America's team thinks that central bank will hike rates twice by February. But as the bank said, the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee, the MPC, sets monetary policy to meet the 2% inflationary target and, in a way, that helps to sustain growth and employment. At its meeting ending on the 2nd of November, the committee judged that the existing stance of monetary policy remained appropriate. The MPC voted by a majority of 7-2 to two to maintain the bank rate at 0.1%. And the committee voted unanimously for the Bank of England to maintain the stock of sterling non-financial investment grade corporate bond purchases financed by the issuance of central bank reserves at £20 billion. And the committee voted by a majority of 63 for the Bank of England to continue with its existing programme of UK government bond purchases financed by the issuance of central bank reserves maintaining the target for the stock of those government bond purchases, £875 billion, and so the total target stock of asset purchases at £895 billion. But all of this money has to flow somewhere, and it has gone into bank reserves at central banks, as well as asset prices, which is why stocks and home prices and even crypto were so extended. In addition, 
If bond prices move the wrong way for the central banks, they may well have big holes in their balance sheets if and when they mark to market. That's something which many have not caught on to yet, so watch this space. And what does all this mean for investors? Well, given the policy shifts, you might think that they could be starting to panic. After all, the amount of cash in the system has been the major force behind market euphoria following the pandemic crash. The main driver in the market today, it's the phenomenal pool of liquidity, vis Regenhaven, JP Morgan's CEO for Europe, the Middle East and Africa said. The market is just awash with money. Every asset class is exceptionally busy. But so far, there has been no taper tantrum, as there was back in 2013, when the Fed signalled that it would eventually deaccelerate asset purchases, sparking a sharp bond sell-off and global market turbulence. The Dow, the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq all hit all-time record highs this week, and the bond market is still holding steady. But why is that? Well, first, the messaging has been extremely clear. Raghaven thinks it's also evident that central banks would be willing to go all in again should the post-pandemic recovery go south. After 2020, their willingness to flex their muscles is no secret. No one wants any economic tumult to sack this recovery, he said. Whatever happens, there will be intervention to assure there's no economic pain. Fed Chair Jerome Powell who last year saw the central bank's balance sheet grow to 7.4 trillion US, the highest level on record, indicated as much on Wednesday. We are prepared to adjust the pace of purchases if warranted by changes in the economic outlook, he said. But with inflation rising at the fastest rate in three decades, the question now is whether central banks will need to taper stimulus even more aggressively or risk missing their moment to keep a lid on price increases. That will require careful communication to keep investors on the same page. Powell said the Fed won't raise interest rates until the labour market makes more progress. But does that mean that the central bank risks getting left behind? And as Bloomberg noted today, the Federal Reserve has had a lot of trouble over the years deciding how hot to let the job market run before raising interest rates. In the late 1960s, it waited too long, and the result was a wage price spiral that helped send inflation into the double digits during the 1970s. In the mid-1910s, it was too quick off the mark, temporarily stifling economic growth and delaying a fully-fledged recovery of the labour market until the end of the decade. Fed Chairman Jerome Powell and his colleagues may soon have to make a call on whether the rebound from the pandemic has brought us to maximum employment. Their task is made more difficult by the mixed signals emanating from the job markets, which has 10.4 million unfilled openings in the US, but 5 million fewer people on payrolls than before the pandemic. The current bound of inflation further complicates their discussions. Prices are rising more than two times faster than the central bank's 2% goal. Fed officials are betting that the pace will slow when supply chain snafus are resolved. But the danger is that inflation could become embedded via a feedback loop. A tight labour market compels employers to pay more and then companies hike prices to recoup the higher labour costs. Wages rose by 4.2% in the US in the third quarter from a year earlier. That's the biggest increase since 2001, according to one government gauge. I do worry that inflation risks have risen significantly, said Brandis University Professor Stephen Coselli. While Powell has acknowledged the labour market is very tight by many measures, he expects that many of the more than the millions of Americans on the sidelines will trickle back in as COVID-19's last wave subsides. That influx of workers should take pressure off wages and inflation and pave the way for a fall in unemployment back to the half-century lows that prevailed before the pandemic. In the next two, three, four months, we're going to see a lot of jobs growth as Delta moves away because people are going to come back in and take up those open positions, says Moody's analytic chief economist Mark Zandi. But what if COVID has wrought more permanent damage to the labour market? A recent St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank study found that more than 3 million Americans retired early because of the crisis. Also, some service jobs, such as those at downtown restaurants that used to cater to office workers, 
or at hotels once packed with travellers, may be gone forever. In Las Vegas, we do know that there are around 50,000 jobs that just are not going to come back in casinos and supporting industries. Elisa Cafetera, director of Nevada's Department of Employment Training and Rehabilitation, told National Public Radio on October the 24th. If the Fed were to keep interest rates low for longer on the expectation that those and other missing jobs might return, it might inadvertently fuel inflation. This idea that many people have that somehow the pre-COVID unemployment rate is a relevant benchmark or that the pre-COVID employment ratio is a relevant benchmark, that's been blown out of the water, said former Treasury Secretary and Bloomberg contributor Lawrence Summers. Tom Gimbel, who has a ground-level view as Chief Executive Officer of staffing agency LaSalle Network, says that in some ways the labour market is tighter than it was in 2019. Setting aside job losses in the face-to-face service industries directly affected by COVID, unemployment is at historic lows in white and blue-collar America, he said. Part of the problem the Fed faces is that economists can't tell what level of employment will trigger inflation in advance. We don't know what it is until we see it, says Michelle Meyer, head of US economics at Bank of America. And the way we see it is by observing wage increases that are persistent and not just one-off hikes. Meanwhile, more broadly, there was a fall in US Treasury yields in the wake of the Federal Reserve signalling on Wednesday that it would be in no rush to begin raising rates despite plans to begin tapering its monthly bond purchases later this month. So markets continue to believe in the low rate story. In other words, that central banks will continue to support the financial markets. But the risk of rising rates is well and truly on the cards. We're already seeing fixed rate mortgages rising in Australia with some sizable hikes at the long end. For example, Big Four Bank Westpac was the first to raise rates after the RBA statement. This mortgage interest rate is the second time the bank has pushed up fixed mortgage rates in just over two weeks. The mortgage rate height applies to owner occupiers with fixed rates. The three year rate has risen by 0.21% to 2.29%, four-year rates have risen by 0.1% to 2.69%, and the five-year rate has also increased by 0.1% to 2.99%. CBA has also pushed up rates for the second time in just over three weeks. CBA has now raised its one- to five-year fixed rates by 0.5% for owner-occupiers and investors. This means CBA now has no advertised home loan rates under 2% for the first time in almost a year. Analysis by Rate City shows a total of 33 lenders have hiked at least one fixed rate in the last month. Four lenders have hiked their fixed rates twice in the last month. That includes CBA, Westpac, AMP and the BDCU Alliance Bank. RateCity.com.au's research director Sally Tyndall said the fixed rate hikes are now coming thick and fast and they're getting bigger as we go. Anyone who is in the process of fixing their rate with Australia's largest banks and didn't pay a rate lock fee will be kicking themselves this morning, she said. The latest round of hikes from CBA is more than just a tweak with increases of up to half a percent on some fixed rates. The mortgage market is undergoing a transformation and it's happening faster than expected. The speed at which global economies are improving has seen the cost of buying funds spike, putting pressure on banks to lift fixed rates. Australia's two largest banks have hiked fixed rates just days after the RBA shift in monetary policy. We expect ANZ and NAB will follow suit in a matter of days, along with a flurry of other lenders. CBA has abandoned its efforts to keep at least one fixed rate under 2%. While a rate starting with a 1 is a great marketing tool, it was clearly unsustainable for the bank. Despite the hikes, Westpac still has two fixed rates under 2%. However, in this climate, it's hard to see those rates sticking around much longer. And the new CBA customers would be quite severely impacted, Rate City says. A customer who is currently applying for a $500,000 three year fixed rate with CBA could potentially pay an extra $5,503 over the fixed rate term if they didn't lock their rate. In this scenario, however, the borrower would have been better off paying CBA's rate lock fee of $375. However, this only applies if rates rise during the application process. 
And that said, Chris Joy at Coolabar wrote that the RBA has made it abundantly clear that it is going to be highly resistant to lifting its cash rate until it observes consistent annual wage growth of 3 to 4%, coupled with core inflation sustainably sitting at or above the midpoint of its target of 2 to 3%. This implies that it will not touch rates until sometime between late 2022 and mid-2023. But of course, that is the cash rate. That doesn't have a huge amount of impact necessarily on mortgage rates. And they are, though, still forecasting ongoing house price appreciation until the RBA hikes and or banks materially lift mortgage rates. More specifically, home values should climb by another 5 to 10 percentage points from present levels. So there is some upside left in this trade, they say. And yet, if and when the RBA does seek to normalise the cash rate, prices should fall as night follows day. And if the RBA is able to lift rates by, say, 100 basis points or more, it will likely be the largest correction on record. Assuming rates increase relatively promptly, say over a 12-month period, they expect national home values to decline by 15 to 25 percent. And it's possible that the adjustment is smaller if the RBA moves more slowly and the value of residential real estate means reverts partly via household income growth over the effluxion of time. But their central case would be around 20% decline after the first 100 basis points of hikes. And they went on to say it's worth noting that if they apply the RBA's internal housing valuation model to this question, they get somewhat bigger numbers. The model was developed by Peter Tulip and Trent Saunders, and it suggests dwelling values could drop by around 33% following 100 basis points of hikes. And while renters might embrace that prospect, homeowners, of course, would obviously rather avoid it. So we really are now at the pointy end of the current cycle. And yet there are so many uncertainties. Will rates stay low? Will they go up? And what are the outflows of that? And meantime, of course, all that liquidity is sloshing around the system and is still going to be there into the future which means that asset prices probably will correct, but not necessarily straight away. Then, of course, we have to overlay market sentiment. And this is the big unknown question, because to my mind, if in fact markets really start believing that growth is going to be slower and earnings are going to be slower and house prices are going to fall, that would be enough to turn markets south. Unless, of course, and this is the big one, unless, of course, they still hang their hat on yet more central bank intervention. And that seems to me to be the thing that is holding everything together at the moment. The religious conviction, because it's just that, that central banks will always get us out of trouble. Now, think about that in two ways. Firstly, where does all that money come from? Well, it basically ultimately comes from us, because essentially they create money and then lend it out. But secondly, of course, think about the distortions that this continues to create in the market with house prices going through the roof, with asset prices well over fair value and with high risks because of high debt sitting there on people's balance sheets, on company balance sheets and now on national balance sheets. Well, thus, it seems to me that the root cause question and issue here is actually the nature and role of central banks. And at the moment... I think they recognise the hangover, but I also think that they are prepared to go with the hair of the dog. We'll see. Now, if you're buying your home in Sydney's contentious market, you don't need to stand alone. This is the time you need to have Edwin Almeida from Ribbon Property Consultants standing alongside you. Buying a property is both challenging and adversarial. The vendor has a professional on their side. Emotions run high, price discovery and price transparency are hard to find, and then there's the wasted time and financial investments that you make. Edwin understands your needs, so why not engage a licensed professional to stand alongside you? With RPC, you know you have experience, knowledge and master negotiators looking after your best interests. So shoot Ribbon an email at info at ribbonproperty.com.au and if you use the promo code DFAWTW slash Martin, you can get a 10% discount offer. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.